This is Phil Koopman with a tutorial on the management of redundancy for safety critical systems. Redundancy is required for mission critical systems both for ensuring safety and ensuring high availability. However, it is very easy to create a redundancy approach that does not give you what you thought it would. Signs that your redundancy approach has problems include First, your system could be unsafe because you are double spending your redundancy. What this means is that you're counting on the same redundancy for both safety and fault detection, which usually does not work out. Next, you may have a problem with redundancy management if you're not doing sufficiently thorough between mission diagnostics to ensure your redundant components are actually still working. And finally, you may have a problem with redundancy management if you have low test coverage on your redundant components when you do that component testing. In June 1999, a gasoline pipeline in Bellingham, Washington ruptured, releasing 237,000 gallons of gasoline. The gasoline flowed into a creek and caught fire, causing a large burn zone that resulted in $45 million of damage and, unfortunately, three fatalities. While several factors contributed to this incident, approximate cause was improper management of a redundant control system. The online controller became non-responsive during a pressure surge, and by the time the backup controller could be brought online, it was too late and the pipeline ruptured. Properly designed redundancy improves reliability and availability, but it is important to consider what will actually happen when a component breaks. There will be a need to detect the fault and then gracefully curtail the current mission. Most likely, the system will need to prohibit the start of a new mission until broken components can be repaired. A related issue is that reliability math assumes that all redundant components are working perfectly at the start of a mission. Any untested redundancy undermines the reliability of the system. The proper use of redundancy starts with considering what purpose the redundancy serves in terms of system dependability. The most common use of redundancy is to improve availability. This is often done with a primary system and a standby system, such as a hot standby that is continuously running as a shadow of the primary system. That way, the hot standby system can take over the instant the primary system fails. A point that is often overlooked is that the standby needs to detect that the primary has failed. Detecting many failures is relatively straightforward using heartbeats or detecting system crashes. However, some failures can be much more difficult to diagnose and might be missed by an automatic failover system. This use of ordinary redundancy for failover works pretty well for low criticality systems in which the risk of an occasionally missed failover is more than offset by the high fraction of times that the failover will work properly. That's especially true if a human can step in to trigger the failover if something weird happens. To go further, we'll start with the assumption that components break infrequently and independently enough that we only need to worry about one component breaking at a time rather than multiple concurrent component failures. Even so, any single component can fail in an arbitrarily bad way, which is known as failing active. While some active failures can be relatively benign, it is always possible for any single component to do the worst thing possible for the safety of your system, such as issuing a dangerous control command. While it is always a great idea to have self-checks, built-in self-test, self-diagnostics, and so on, it is impossible to guarantee that these will detect all failures because, for example, the self-tester itself could be the source of a failure that is causing your system to misbehave. Therefore, any single component is unsafe for life-critical applications or high-sill mission-critical applications, such as, for example, SIL-3 or SIL-4 systems. Having a standby component does not solve this because the standby mechanism is solving an availability problem, not a fault detection problem. A different use for redundancy is for fault detection, 
as shown by the two of two fail silent pattern. With this pattern, there are two identical computers called channel one and channel two. Each of those identical channels has its own independent set of inputs, and the two channels run identical software and identical computations. The two channels continually cross-check their internal state by, for example, exchanging digests of internal RAM values. They also cross-check their outputs, although in this presentation we will not draw the output arcs explicitly just to try and keep the diagram simple. The two channels cooperate for producing system outputs. If either channel suffers a fault, the cross-check will detect a mismatch between the internal state or the outputs, and the channels will mutually do a safety shutdown. The net effect is that a component fails silent, meaning that it is either working 100% properly or it does a clean shutdown, but never actually does anything wrong. Because this redundancy is used for cross-checking, it does not help availability. In fact, you can say it hurts availability by shutting down as fast as possible if something goes wrong, but that does provide safety. It is certainly tempting to try to come up with some sort of hybrid failover redundancy and cross-checking combination. For example, one could say you will cross-check until there's a failure, and then use self-diagnosis to figure out which component failed and put the good one in charge. This will probably work some of the time, or even most of the time. But once in a while, you'll hit a case where the self-diagnosis is inconclusive. Both systems will say they're just fine, and then you have to pick perhaps the bad one to be in charge, becoming unsafe. Or the two components will keep fighting over who's broken, and your system will enter limbo where it's neither working nor broken. To be sure, there are some situations in which a hybrid approach is a good idea, but usually such systems have additional redundancy someplace else to take care of problems when the hybrid scheme doesn't really work out. It is extremely important to realize that you cannot double spend your redundancy. Detecting a failure takes two components. If you want to operate after that failure, you need at least one additional component beyond that or you risk component failures being able to make the system unsafe. One famous safety-critical computing pattern is triplex modular redundancy, sometimes called TMR, or two out of three. The idea is to use three identical computers, shown here as channels one, two, and three, and then add a majority voter. If you ignore the voter, you're using three computers to do the job of one, and the first two are there for fault detection, and the third is there for availability. How it works with the voter is that if any one of the channels fails, the other two will outvote it, and the output will still be correct. This approach can work for some systems, especially where the channels are relatively unreliable, and the voter can be tens or hundreds or thousands of times more reliable than any of the individual components. So if you have complicated channels, and a simple voter, this can work well for non-life critical systems. However, the voter is a single point of failure, because a broken voter can do whatever it wants. Thus, for high SIL applications, such as life critical applications, you either need to have redundancy inside the voter to make sure the voter itself is reliable, or use some other approach. A key observation here is that triplex modular redundancy does not have three components, but rather four components, and the majority voter is a significant reliability bottleneck for the whole system. A commonly used approach to get past the voter bottleneck is the dual two of two approach. In this system, a two of two cross-checked pair is used as the primary control for the system. If there is a fault in the system, the entire two of two block will shut down. That means you need a second block, and that's also going to be a two of two block as a backup. In this case, each of the two two of two blocks does internal fault detection, so each block is fail silent. You have a pair of those so that if one two of two block fails silent, the other two of two block can take over. This pattern is commonly used in rail switches 
and in practice, the primary and secondary blocks are swapped periodically to make sure that both blocks are still working. Another redundancy mechanism is the doer checker approach, sometimes called a monitor actuator pair. An example of this approach is a combination of a low sill doer and a high sill checker. The low sill doer is in charge of doing the normal system operation. However, it might end up doing something unsafe, so the system is designed to fail silent by having a checker shut down the whole thing if the doer misbehaves. In this case, we're using a high sill checker because the system itself is high sill, meaning it is life critical or the equivalent. A problem with the simple version of this pattern is that the checker itself could fail. So if the checker were only a single CPU, it might have an internal fault missed by its self-diagnosis and end up not checking properly. That's why for this pattern, we're using a two of two pair for the checker. So that makes sure that the checker will catch any internal faults. And that checker checks a single one of one doer, which operates at a lower safety integrity level. So if the doer makes a mistake, the checker will shut it down. And if either of the two CPUs in the checker makes a mistake, the other checker will shut down the whole checking block, which also results in the doer being shut down. At this point, you're noticing that we're using three computers to do the job of one. But the reason that this can still be a win is that in many systems, much of the software does not have to be safety critical. Only a small amount does. So this pattern lets you put the non-critical software into the doer and have a much simpler, smaller checker piece of software that operates in the two of two checker hardware. So it might be that the doer is a big 32-bit CPU with lots of resources, and the checkers might only be 8-bit CPUs that are just enough to get the checking done. Because high sill software can be dramatically more expensive to develop than low sill software, this approach can be a significant win in system cost because of the reduced software development costs. These are just examples of how various patterns can be used. Any particular system should use the right combination of patterns. The typical mechanisms that are combined are two of two pairs for fault detection, a doer checker strategy for isolating high and low sill software, and using hot standby to improve availability after a fault occurs. A critical point when deploying redundancy is that while on the one hand, Reliability math lets you assume only one component fails at a time. On the other hand, you also need to ensure that all the components are working perfectly at the start of a mission. That means you need to be able to find and eliminate any latent faults before the mission starts. One way to find latent faults is with online diagnostics, such as a self-test at the start of the mission or continual background checks while the system is operating. While these cannot find all faults, they are certainly important for safety-critical systems. Creating a thorough self-test can be very challenging, so you should use a vendor-supplied library such as IEC 6730 self-tests if you can. Another way to improve diagnostic coverage is by using a thing called a proof test. It's called a proof test because the purpose of the test is to prove that the redundancy or safety function is still working properly. Let's use an elevator safety limit switch as an example to motivate why you would want a proof test. If you have been to a shopping mall or an airport that has an open air glass enclosed elevator, you might have looked into the enclosure to the top and seen something that looks like this. The bottom right of the picture shows the top of the elevator car frame going from the middle bottom of the picture up to the middle right of the picture. The elevator has a guide rail that keeps it from jiggling around and swinging in the hoistway. And there are guide wheels to follow that rail as the elevator moves up. However, at some point, the guide rail has to end. And it would be very bad if the elevator just popped off the end of that guide rail. The way you know the elevator won't pop off the end of the rail is that there is a metal bar attached to the car frame that hits position switches as the elevator moves. 
In normal operation, this bar, which is now highlighted in yellow, shoves the top floor position switch to one side, causing the computer to stop the elevator at that top floor. However, that switch will eventually break, and we want to have redundancy to avoid overrunning the top floor. There's an overrun safety switch to detect when the elevator has gone past the top floor and is about to run off the end of the rail. This switch is just there in case the top floor switch fails. Well, that sounds great, but how do you know that the overrun safety switch is actually working? It should never be exercised when the elevator works, so you have no idea in normal operation whether that switch works because it's never supposed to be actuated. The answer to this is use a proof test to intentionally overrun the top floor and activate that switch. This can be done every once in a while by an elevator mechanic running the elevator very slowly in a manual safety mode just to make sure that switch is tested. Testing that switch is a proof test to prove that it still works. This is a general concept and needs to be applied periodically to any redundancy to make sure the redundancy is still there and still working. That includes sensors, actuators, and redundant computational elements. What proof tests are really getting at is looking for latent undetected faults, which are faults in the redundancy that you cannot tell are there because normal functionality masks the failure in the redundancy. For two of two systems, the worry is that a fault will happen in one of the two channels, it will be missed, and the other channel will accumulate the same fault sometime later. For any redundancy, you want to do online detection that includes frequent cross-checks not only of system outputs, but also of the internal state of the system to make sure that no bits that are used very seldom get corrupted in a way that is unnoticed. You also want to swap active units in a primary standby pair. That way, each of the pair gets a chance to be the lead unit and gets exercised in normal use. Finally, you need to do periodic offline detection by enforcing proof tests that can consist both of extensive self-tests and human-assisted diagnostics. The best practices in redundancy management involve understanding what happens when a component fails in your system and making sure that you design your redundancy to handle that appropriately. Keep in mind that some redundancy is dedicated to fault detection, while other redundancy is aimed at availability. It's important to ask the question, what happens when a component breaks, to make sure that you can both detect and survive failures. Diagnostic coverage matters in systems because redundancy that is broken isn't there to provide you with fault detection or availability when you need it. Diagnostics have to be accomplished via testing before mission starts, online cross-checks to ensure no faults happen at runtime, and proof tests for things that are not feasible to test automatically. The goal of diagnostics is to minimize the potential for latent, undetected faults that undermine your redundancy. The biggest pitfall is that if you get redundancy wrong, you can have a safety-critical system failure, such as this accident at an undisclosed plant. Make sure you do not double-spend your redundancy. First spend redundancy on detection, and then spend more redundancy on failover if you need it. Typically, trying something fancy doesn't work. You need to be extremely careful if you try and cut corners or be clever about redundancy. Also, don't forget to look for common mode failures, such as software updates that could compromise multiple channels of your system at the same time.